the Committee on Homeland Security will come to order. Without objection, uh, there's some back. TV volumes. Oh. Oh, okay. So the Committee on Homeland Security will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare the committee in recess at any point. Good morning. The committee is meeting to examine the targeting of black institutions from church violence to university bomb threats. Exactly a year ago, Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas testified before this committee that domestic extremist uh, violence represents the greatest threat to the homeland right now. Today, we are here to discuss how one form of extremism, white supremacist violence, threatens black institutions, particularly black churches and historically black colleges and universities. Data from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, shows that right-wing extremism has surged to dangerous levels. Since 2015, right-wing extremists have been responsible for 267 plots and attacks and 91 deaths. No one can forget the tragedy at Mother Emanuel African American Episcopal Church in Charleston in June 2015 when a radicalized white supremacist murdered nine churchgoers while shouting racial epithets. According to the CSIS, black churches were targeted in another 15 plots or attack from 2016 to April 2021. As a son of the South, I know all too well the horror that shakes a community when a house of worship is attacked. And today, we find ourselves confronting an unprecedented rise in threats of violence against HBCUs. Between January 4th and February 4th of this year, the FBI identified a staggering 51 total bomb threats, 28 targeting HBCUs, and 12 targeting black churches. There have been at least eight more bomb threats in the last six weeks. While the nature of violence toward black institutions may have evolved over the years, the attacks are by no means new. When I was coming of age in Mississippi, white supremacists attacked black churches with impunity. Many were firebombed, burned, or destroyed. I also recall with great sadness the tragedy that occurred at Jackson State University when I was a young man. In May 1970, 75 police officers sent to the campus to break up a protest. In a use of force incident, the President's Commission on Campus Unrest later called an unreasonable, unjustified overreaction. Police fired 140 shots toward a dormitory building, tragically killing two students and injuring another 12. Shortly after I was elected to Congress, our nation was again confronted with a resurgence in attacks on black churches. In 1995 to 96 alone, there were as many as 35 burnings of black churches. And here we are yet again today. These attacks sickened me. These terrorists, and they are terrorists, whether they be engaged in physical violence or threats of such, seek to intimidate good people from exercising their religious beliefs and receiving an education. While these institutions have shown remarkable resilience under terrible circumstances, their academic or religious missions are too often hampered by having <laughs> a divert resources to ensure safety and security. Congress has heard and answered the call for increasing funding for the nonprofit security grant program. This program provides funding for physical security enhancements and other security related activities to nonprofit organizations, such as houses of worship and universities that are at high risk of a terrorist attack. In fiscal year 2021, Congress doubled funding for the program to 180 million, but significant needs remain. In response, Congress increased funding from the program to 250 million in the fiscal year 2022 omnibus spending bill President Biden signed into law this week. Additionally, I have introduced legislation 
co-sponsored by ranking member CATCO that would authorize $500 million for the program. This legislation would also create an office task with conducting outreach, education, and technical assistance to eligible nonprofits with a particular focus on underserved communities. As someone with a long history with the NNPSG program, I'm pleased that we are holding this hearing today to get testimony on the record about its importance and how it might further strengthen, be further strengthened. I'm also pleased to see that yesterday, the Biden administration announced that HBCUs will be able to access grant funds under the Project School Emergency Response to Violence Program to restore a safe learning environment. There are important steps, but much more remains to be done to help communities who have been hurt by this violence, bring the perpetrators to justice and prevent further threats and attacks. It's an unconscionable that Americans practicing their faith at houses of worship are obtaining an education to better themselves, their families, and future generations would have to fear for their lives. Indeed, racially motivated threats and violence against black churches and schools are attacks on these institutions, but also on our American way of life. Our response must be swift and serious, commensurate with the persistent threat. I'm honored to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before the committee this morning and look forward to hearing their testimony on this important topic. Reverend Eric Manning joined Mother Emanuel AME Church, Charleston, South Carolina, as a senior pastor in June 2016, a year after the tragic shooting. He's lifted his church and community in the years since the terrorist attack and has continued to be a voice of social justice. My friend, Mr. Thomas Hudson, president of Jackson State University, is leading his university as it confronts this new wave of threats. President Hudson offers a unique perspective as HBCU address this ongoing crisis. Finally, I look forward to hearing from Ms. Janet Nelson uh, about the broader threat landscape facing black institutions and what the federal government can do to help keep these communities safe. I also wish to congratulate her on her recent promotion, becoming the eighth president of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Thank you again. I look forward to your testimony. I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Katko. For Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your insight and powerful statements. Uh, uh, I appreciate them. And I thank you for holding this important hearing today. And to our witnesses, thank you for joining us uh, in person and virtually, I think one of them is virtually, to discuss a troubling issue that threatens the safety and, Amer and security of Americans throughout the United States. Unfortunately, it's not confined to the black community, the Jewish community, including in my city, city uh, suffered a, a, a bombing of a, a, of a temple uh, when I was a prosecutor. And uh, it, this type of conduct, it, it just, it's just sickening in today's day. Uh, threats against African Americans are an ugly part of American history and an issue our country clearly still struggles with. Throughout the civil rights area, era, African Americans were subject to violent and often deadly assaults as they fought for the simple right of equality. Birmingham, Alabama alone, which served as a focal point of the civil rights movement, experienced more than 40 deadly bombings between the late 40s and the mid 60s, earning it the dubious nickname Bombingham. While our nation has thankfully made a great progress, we still have much work to do to ensure that all our citizens feel safe within our borders. Thank you, Reverend Manning, for being here today. It is devastating to recall the evening of June 17th 2015, when a mass shooter took the lives of nine African-American congregants who were attending Bible study at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston. This race-fueled attack at an historic African-American church shook our nation to its core, causing all of us to reflect on the fact that inherently evil acts of violence continue to exist in many forms. And that is why we are here. And that is our main mission. I'm grateful to have you here today to discuss how this horrific day shaped the church's external engagement to enhance security and any insights you may have into how Congress can better support the safety and security of religious institutions of all stripes. Almost a decade later, we are now dealing with a series of threats 
most of them targeted at the safety and well-being of predominantly black ac academic communities. The FBI reported that 57 historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, and houses of worship were targeted with bomb threats from January 4th through February 16th of this year. The FBI has dedicated more than 20 field offices to investigating these threats, which they've categorized as hate crimes. While we are thankful that no bombs have been discovered, these threats have derailed educational and religious operations while instilling fear in the hearts of students, faculty, administration, administrators, and worshipers. And to digress for a moment, the next step is what's been happening in the Jewish community where people are losing their lives. And that's something we just can't have. I commend the federal, state, and local law enforcement efforts to bring the perpetrators of these crimes to justice. While law enforcement officers work to apprehend those responsible, Congress has a sacred duty to ensure educational institutions and houses of worship have access to and knowledge of every safety and security tool in our federal toolbox. The Department of Homeland Security offers a variety of grants, including nonprofit security grants and targeted violence and terrorist prevention grants to nonprofits and institutions of higher education to establish or enhance secure security capabilities, mitigate targeted violence, and prevent terrorism. At the same time, the FBI offers security, training, including active shooter training, to teach leaders at schools, houses of worship, and other at-risk settings how to respond to threats and save lives. It is vital that soft targets, such as our colleges and churches, are aware of these resources and that we bolster their relationship with law enforcement to prevent violence within our communities. Again, drawing on my experience with what's happening with the Jewish community across this country, most Jewish uh, communities now have a very robust and active uh, security apparatus, and that's something we should talk about today. I'm excited to hear from our witnesses today about how they are working to protect HBCUs and African American houses of worship. I'm looking forward to learning more about the unique threats their institutions face, the partnerships they have fostered with law enforcement, the capabilities they have to report and combat violence, and how Congress can strengthen all of these efforts. Threats against historically black institutions are attacks on the core freedoms promised to all Americans. Efforts to derail any person's ability to seek higher education or pursue their religious freedoms is an assault on their fundamental constitutional rights, and the justice system must address it swiftly and severely. I want to thank you again to our witnesses for being here today. I look forward to our conversation, and I yield back the, my time. Gentlemen, years back, other members of the committee are reminded that under committee rules, opening statements may be submitted for the record. Members are also reminded that the committee will operate according to the guidelines laid out by the chairman and ranking member in our February 3rd, 3rd 2021 colloquy regarding remote procedures. I now welcome our panel of witnesses. Our first witness, Reverend Eric Manning, is a senior pastor at the Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Prior to accepting his appointment to Mother Emanuel in June 2016, Reverend Emanuel led four other AME churches in South Carolina over 12, and ye 12 years. Our second witness, uh, Mr. Thomas K. Hudson, JD, is president of Jackson State University located in Jackson, Mississippi. He was named the university's president in November 2020 after serving as acting president and in several key leadership roles at the university, including chief operating officer and Chief Diversity and EEO Officer. Our final witness is Ms. Jenny S. Nelson, uh, the new, newly appointed President and Director, Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Prior to the role, Ms. Nelson served as the Associate Director Counsel at the organization where she's worked for the past eight years. Without objection, the witness's full statement will be inserted in the record. I now ask each witness to summarize their statements for five minutes, uh, beginning with Reverend Manning. Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Cato and the Committee on Homeland Security, I thank you for this opportunity uh, to share some thoughts with you this morning. Uh, this is the first time that I ever had the privilege to appear before a congressional committee, and please know how deeply humbled I am for this opportunity to share with you today some reflections on the pain that was experienced by deliberate and sinful act that is rooted in hate. 
While there have been many attacks levied against the black church throughout history for the purpose of this testimony today, I will only highlight two. The first being the 16th Street uh, Baptist Church, the site of one sinful act that was rooted in hate, where on Sunday, September 15th, 1963 at 1022 a.m., while worshipers were gathering for worship service and church school was concluding, four, four church school attendees were murdered. Addie Mae Collins, 14, Cynthia Wesley, 14, Carol Robertson, 14, Carol Denise McNear, 11. While this sinful act of hate took place over 57 years ago, this community still is feeling the pain that was afflicted upon them. The second sinful act of hate that occurred here at Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, where on June 17, 2015, at the conclusion of Bible study, a lone white supremacist entered and came into our Bible study and murdered nine members, Reverend Sharonda Coleman Singleton, 45, Cynthia May Graham Heard, 54, Susie J. Jackson, 87, Ethel Lee Lance, 70, Reverend DePayne Middleton, 49, Honorable Reverend Clemente C. Pickney, 41, Tawanza Sanders, 26, Reverend Daniel L. Simmons Sr., 74, and Myra Thompson, 41, or 59, excuse me. Uh, there were also five survivors, Felicia Sanders, Polly Shepard, Jennifer Pinckney, and two minor children. The entire congregation was stunned and rendered speechless by an unbelievable act of horror. It left an undeniable stain on all of our hearts, our minds, and our memories. Our sacred sanctuary had become a crime scene. It is important to understand that both crimes rooted in hate struck at the heart of the black community, which is indeed the church. In many communities, the church is the place where the community gathers for fellowship, comfort, discuss community concerns, and most importantly, share the liberating gospel of Jesus Christ. When an act is levied against the black church, it has a lingering effect. And I'm not sure how long it will truly take for these respective communities to heal, especially, of course, when they have been dealt such a major blow that is rooted in the sin of racism. I have served as the pastor of Mother Emanuel now for almost six years, and I can truly say that every member is in a different place when it comes to healing. Many continue to deal with the lingering impact, uh, knowing that their sacred place or house of worship has been violated by the sin of racism. To this day, there are still many members who have not yet returned. I would characterize the lingering effects of trauma as a long-term opportunity, meaning that we must still seek resources that will help the members to recover. In short term, immediately following the tragedy of the church, the church was able to develop a security plan. The security plan was implemented by the church and continues to be updated on a regular basis. To date, the church has spent well over $50,000 when it comes to church security. I would have hoped that by now that we would have been able to throttle back this budgetary item. However, uh, it is still one that we utilize on a regular basis. Tragically, we we live in a world where sin and hate is so strong and many houses of worship will need to develop detailed security plans. I believe that we are all that we can all still come together to find sustainable solutions that would protect all houses of worship. Understanding, though, that this would require all of us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. I want to believe that we could truly embrace what Abraham Lincoln said. Let us discard all quabbling about this man or the other man, this race or that race or the other race being inferior. And let us discard these things and unite as one people throughout this land until we shall once more stand up declaring that all men are created equal. But until that time comes, let us continue to look for ways to protect houses of worship as non as the nonprofit security grant program act of 2022 hr 6825 prayerfully will do thank you again for this opportunity to share with you all today thank you for your testimony reverend manning i now recognize president hudson to summarize his statement for five minutes good morning chairman thompson and members of this committee 
I'd like to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. While I wish my presence before you was due to other circumstances, I do believe this is a conversation of necessity. The recent bomb threats against the institution I lead, my alma mater, Jackson State University, and the almost two dozen other HBCUs make a mockery of how far we've come as a nation. There's always a group of individuals who will attempt to drag us back to a time when terrorizing our communities was a frequent occurrence, often without admonishment. The threat we received on February 1, 2022 was an attempt once again to incite mass anxiety and fear reminiscent of yesteryear. The, target of, the targeting of black schools and sacred institutions has taken place in our country since their inception. Then and now, these threats are designed to intimidate and impede our sense of safety and freedom in an environment where our students deserve to feel protected at all times. At JSU, we were fortunate that our local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies rallied behind us during this time. We appreciate the efforts of the Jackson Police Department, State of Mississippi Capitol Police, and the FBI, who responded not just in words, but in action, helping to provide the necessary resources to mitigate this threat. And of course, we thank the JSU Department of Public Safety, who on this day and every day work hard to protect our campus and our students. Collectively, it is our responsibility to create safe environments for our campus community. They should be able to receive a nurturing learning experience in a protective environment free from distraction. But what will it take for us to ensure the long-term protection of not only our students, faculty, staff, and stakeholders, but the historical assets that are HBCUs? It is with this context that I would like to address the areas in which this committee may assist us in this endeavor. We can do this by ensuring that HBCUs receive equitable resources, close the significant disparity between our security challenges and our funding, and also counter those disparities, thus ensuring sustainability. I think we all know the history of HBCUs that our institutions were founded to educate newly freed black people who could not attend the already established colleges and universities. Today, there are over 100 historically black colleges and universities in this country, and together we have educated millions, helping them realize the American dream that was elusive to their ancestors. The intended disruption of HBCUs, like Jackson State University, is an intentional assault on the economic drivers of this country. It is a deliberate attempt to destroy these cultural spaces where intellect and diverse thought thrives. We cannot sit idly by and wait for something to happen to these hallowed spaces. We cannot afford to be reactionary. While we share similarities with other colleges and universities, the truth is, unlike our counterparts, we have been routinely underfunded for years, which has led to deferred maintenance and deficiencies within our infrastructure. There is a significant mismatch between our security challenges and the adequate funding levels to address this incongruity which often puts us in a reactionary position due to our historical and persistent under-resourcing. Uh, under but there is a way forward. At JSU, we aim to be a part of the solution by partnering with this body and others in addressing these deep-rooted issues. Our close collaboration with the Department of Homeland Security through their Office of Academic Engagement offers an exceptional opportunity to expand our capacity and access to these much-needed resources. We seek the resources to develop and utilize data science technology so that we may better understand and motivate resilient strategy while we build trust in the most vulnerable communities. We anticipate long-term investments to expand and sustain our criminal justice and urban planning programs in order to elevate and develop local and statewide solutions to serve as a national model and resources. Developing a tiered approach to resolving HBCU security issues and concerns is a must. We must also develop partnerships with our local school districts to jointly pursue those initiatives for early intervention. I would like to close by saying that we shall not be moved or paralyzed by malevolent threats. I am calling on you to help us bolster our arsenals because we all have the responsibility of ensuring our students can develop in environments free of violence, racism, and intolerance. We must protect our HBCUs so that transformational education can and will always prevail. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Hudson, for your testimony.
I now recognize Attorney Nelson to summarize her statement for five minutes. Thank you and good morning, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Katko, and members of the committee. My name is Janae Nelson, and I am the President and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the escalating threat of violence against black institutions and for your example of bipartisan partnership and leadership in introducing H.R. 6825. The Legal Defense Fund is a black legacy institution. Founded in 1940 under the leadership of Thurgood Marshall, a graduate of two historically black universities, Lincoln University and Howard University School of Law, LDF was launched at a time of widespread state-sponsored violence and inequality. As the organization that litigated Brown versus Board of Education, which ended legal apartheid in the US, LDF has long led the struggle for education equity, and that struggle is ongoing. On January 4th, 2022, at least eight HBCUs received what would be the first of an escalating number of bomb threats in just the first three months of this year. Following this initial rash of bomb threats, the FBI released a statement that they were being, quote, investigated as racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism and hate crimes. As Chairman Thompson met, mentioned, this is a national security threat. The attacks did not stop. During the month of February, Black History Month, there was not a single week in which the safety and security of an HBCU and its predominantly black student populations were not threatened with terrorist violence. An estimated 57 HBCUs and churches have received bomb threats this year alone. To understand why HBCUs are the target of such vitriol, we must understand their history. HBCUs were established in the early 19th century in direct resistance to state-sponsored denial of education for black people. HBCUs were created to be safe havens for a people for whom education was previously illegal or out of reach. They provided and continue to provide to this day the opportunity for predominantly black student populations to receive a quality post-secondary education in a nurturing environment that lays bare the myths of white supremacy and black inferiority. Although HBCUs make up only 3% of the country's colleges and universities, they enroll 10% of all black students and produce almost 20% of all black graduates, including Howard University alumna Kamala Harris, the first black woman vice president of the United States. And there is a long and ignominious history of bomb threats made and realized upon other black institutions in the United States. As Reverend Manning mentioned, in 1963, the KKK infamously bombed the 16th Street Baptist Church, killing four young girls and terrorizing more than 400 congregants. Black churches have remained a target of white extremist hate and violence, as evidenced by the horrific mass killing at Mother Emanuel in 2015. This nation also has a shameful history of using the powers of the state and private acts of violence to prevent black people from receiving an education. HBCUs sit at the intersection of these painful histories of violence against black people, black legacy institutions, black advancement, and black education. And although white extremist activity and violence are not new, there has been a disturbing increase in recruitment, propaganda, and visibility of such groups in recent years. In 2021, the FBI warned this very committee that, quote, the top threat we face from domestic violent extremists stems from those we identify as racially, ethnically motivated violent extremists. Indeed, racism is our greatest threat to national security. The bomb threats made to HBCUs are evidence of increased violence across the country. To reverse this harmful trend, in addition to the ongoing investigation of, by the FBI, this committee must conduct a parallel investigation to ascertain the specific animus of these attacks, to determine how future occurrences can be prevented, and to issue findings and solutions to prevent this ongoing threat. Congress must also ensure that HBCUs and other legacy institutions have the necessary funding to protect themselves from future attacks. To that end, 
Congress should pass H.R. 6825, the Nonprofit Security Grant Program Improvement Act, which would expand and strengthen the Nonprofit Security Grant Program. Despite these threats of terrors, HBCUs have remained resilient in their mission and black religious organizations continue to serve as a central institution in black communities across the nation. But the continuing threat of racialized violence and the targeting of black institutions is a scenario that no student, faculty, or staff member, religious leader, devotee, or institution should have to endure in 2022. We call on Congress to bring the full power and resources of the federal government to protect these hallowed institutions that strengthen and enrich our society and to ensure the safety and security of every resident of this country, regardless of race or ethnicity, especially those who are targets of domestic racial terror. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the witnesses for their uh, excellent testimony. Uh, at this point, I will uh, ask questions and then refer to the ranking members for, for his. Uh, <clears throat> President Hudson, normally when people send their children uh, to a college or university, there are some assumptions about safety and security. Can you share with the committee what impact those threats had uh, with both student faculty and the parents of those young people attending Jackson State University? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, it brings a sense of anxiety and fear, uh, introduces that to the learning process, which should never be a part of the learning process. Uh, the hardest part about being a student should come in the classroom and not outside the classroom. And what this does is introduce a level of anxiety. It also, with respect to our parents who, again, want to ensure their students' safety, it causes them to look at the university and look to us for what additional steps we may be able to take to ensure that these things don't happen again. As you are aware, most HBCUs like JSU sit in urban centers. And while these add to the culture of the university, they do make us more vulnerable. So at JSU, we're having to take steps around the infrastructure of the campus to really work to assure and give those assurances to parents that we do have the ability to make their children safe. Uh, it is an ongoing effort. It does impact learning, uh, but we're determined to mitigate that as much as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, and I assume with that comes a price tag. Uh, yes, sir, it does. It does. And also, I might add, you know, security data systems, uh, which is a primary weakness for a lot of HBCUs, just the ability to store that level of data uh, that allows us to better monitor the campus in the areas around campus. All of those things come with a price tag. And again, the underfunding that I uh, discussed earlier does play a role in kind of keeping us behind in that effort. Thank you very much. Reverend Manning. Again, the assumption is that uh, when people come to church, there is an expectation uh, that as a house of worship, uh, you are safe. The experience at Mother Emanuel uh, is quite the opposite. Can you tell us uh, in the wake of what occurred, what uh, you as a church uh, have put together to secure uh, uh, the, the safety and security of those persons worshiping there? Well, uh, Chairman Thompson, I would, I would say initially, of course, what we did uh, and part of my testimony was the short term, uh, which was developing a security plan, and then of course, rolling out multiple cameras uh, across the entire campus. Uh, now, of course, uh, pre-COVID, when we would gather for worship um, or even Bible study or meetings at the church, we would have off-duty police officers uh, to continue to provide uh, at least a, a form of comfort uh, for all the prisoners that are coming in. Uh, we also have uh, a security detail within Mother Emanuel as well. Uh, who are pre-military and also have experience in law enforcement area. 
So we have done our very best to ensure that the members are safe when they come in to the worship service. Uh, one of the things that we have been kind of slow to do uh, is to work through an active shooter uh, scenario, uh, just by virtue of the fact that this is still a crime scene. Uh, and many members are still traumatized, even when they see yellow signs uh, that are on the outside of the church. So we have tried to gently, as we possibly could, being trauma-informed, do our very best to ensure that all the members are safe when they do come in. Uh, as I said before, by hiring off-duty police officers, deploying cameras, having key fobs, uh, and also um, various other security measures. Thank you very much. Uh, given what you've heard, Ms. Nelson, and your experience with your organization, uh, do you see the value of a nonprofit security grant in helping uh, these institutions and, uh, in order to secure themselves? And if you have some recommendations as to other things we could uh, do as a, a Congress, I'd love to hear from you at this point. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I absolutely think that the expansion of funding for HBCUs for other nonprofit institutions and, and places of worship is essential as a, as a preventive measure for additional violence. The threat against black institutions continues to loom large. It continues to impact the psyches of students and, and parishioners who attend religious institutions. And it also has a significant financial impact. These institutions are now required to provide security in a way that many other institutions don't have to worry about simply because of the racial or religious makeup of their constituencies. This requires not just additional physical infrastructure, but technological support. It also, for HBCUs in particular, may require additional resources around mental health services. Students have been traumatized by these threats of violence that disrupt their learning environment and that subject them to a constant threat of potential violence in a space that is meant to be a safe haven for their education. And so those resources can serve to improve the campus environment and improve the safety and protect those populations both on campuses and at religious institutions across the country. See, I recognize his ranking member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Reverend Manning, when I was listening to your testimony, I was recalling the carnage that your congregation experienced. And it's just, uh, it's unfathomable to me as a, as a father and as a husband and a uh, former prosecutor. It really, uh, I remember that day and, um, uh, my only regret is that I wasn't able to leave this job and prosecute that individual myself. Um, but going forward, um, uh, I heard from you, you mentioned your security plan and, and the chairman asked about it. And uh, I wanna talk a little bit more about that, but I wanna know what President Hudson, Hudson said as well, is that he said words to the effect that we shouldn't be intimidated by these threats, and I couldn't agree more. But you also mentioned the anxiety and fear that students, and, and uh, I think the Reverend talked about the um, the anxiety and the fear that people are experiencing because of these threats and because of these horrific acts. And um, to some extent, based on my experience with some of the other religious institutions uh, that have been subject of attacks like these, uh, that fear can be ameliorated by a really good security plan. And I got, I, that's really what I wanna talk about. And, and, and Reverend, when I heard you talk about the security plan and it cost you more than $50,000, I started doing the math in my head, and even though I stink at math, it doesn't take a, a genius to figure out that before too long, uh, uh, the numbers get real as to the numbers we need to help you with these grants. So, um, Reverend Manning, when you talk about it, it was more, I think you said the security plan you had was cost more than $50,000. Uh, what time period are you talking about for that? Thank you, um, Ranking Member Cato as well. I think. No, I think that that plan actually or that cost has been since 2015 up to present day. OK, thank you very much. So, that's uh, that's that, that, that's helpful. Uh, you know, there's a lot of churches, right? Now, now we have these threats of universities and, and, and President Hudson, have you ever tried to put a, a dollar figure on what it would cost to 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 make your your campus more secure and 
and uh, what would that entail? Uh, yes, and before I uh, cite the specific number, I must add that uh, holistically, you're looking at more training uh, for your campus security, uh, campus police. You're looking at better uh, data science capabilities, increasing your bandwidth, uh, increasing your ability to store the type of data you need so you can do your threat assessments and go back and provide the historical analysis. You're talking about the overall infrastructure of campus. As I mentioned before, most of our HBCUs and a lot of universities in general sit in those urban areas with open access that does make us more vulnerable to attack. So how do you fix the infrastructure mm -hmm. around campus to make your campus, while you still want to be accessible to the community, it does provide a few more checkpoints and does help with that overall safety. Uh, from a price tag standpoint, the infrastructural improvements alone, the physical improvements, uh, cost around $10 million is our price tag. When you get into data- One university. That's one university, mm -hmm. correct. Uh, when you get into data access, data security, access to data, increasing your bandwidth, you can tack on a couple of more million just for that, but again, that's gonna be an ongoing cost. Those are monthly things that you have to continue to monitor. So those are just some of them. Certainly the grants, uh, the $50,000 grant, will help in some of the training efforts that you need to really help get you started, and also in helping you develop those holistic plans, which themselves have a price tag before you even get to the real work. So it's gonna be an ongoing effort. This is something we will forever deal with. Threats can come at any time. You always have to take those steps to mitigate those risks and those threats. Uh, again, appreciate this committee for working with us and really being partners with us and how do we become, provide solutions not only for GSU but other HBCUs and universities across the nation. Uh, thank you very much. And you know, I, I think about the very first bill I had passed in Congress was uh, to honor Gerardo Hernandez, a TSA officer who was shot and killed at an airport and uh, just by doing his job in an airport in LA. And that bill mandated the training uh, like uh, active shooter training situations and, and trying to get people to think actively about what to do if this situation arises. And that's something I think we need to uh, uh, think about going forward. I would strongly encourage however many dollars we can get you that that be a high priority because the active shooter training really does work and really does help save lives. So I would, I would just respectfully offer that as well. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, and I, you're absolutely correct. The other thing we're trying to put together is a packet of resources that we can offer colleges, universities, house of worship uh, from the training and coordination standpoint, because when these things happen, it's not just the security apparatus of that institution involved, it's all the other people who come. So. Yeah, it's clearly a, hol a, a holistic effort, uh, and uh, that's the essence of what the Homeland Security is about, so I agree with you totally. That's right. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to say good morning to our, our witnesses. Thank you for... Uh, your, your very uh, poignant, very uh, insightful and important testimony today. Um, it, the, uh, uh, it really seems unreasonable to me that uh, we should expect uh, HBCUs to, uh, to handle uh, addressing uh, the, these increasing uh, threats of violence alone. So I'm glad that we're in this hearing today. And the same goes for, for other black institutions like House of Worship, as illustrated by uh, Reverend uh, Manning's uh, poignant testimony this morning. And I just want to begin by commending my friend uh, Chairman Thompson for his efforts to uh, invigorate the, the nonprofit security grant program to address uh, this issue, uh, increasing uh, the, the funding for this program, uh, as this Congress did last week, uh, and uh, as the Nonprofit Security Grant Improvement Act would do uh, even further, I believe is a, is a critical step. And I also think it's critical to raise awareness of, of the security resources that are available uh, for black institutions in this time of uh, increased racially motiv motivated violence. Uh, if I could start uh, with uh, President Hudson and Ms. Nelson, in your testimony, you spoke of the, the funding challenges that face uh, HBCUs like uh, Jackson State University, uh, but also of how the increase in bomb threats at HBCUs 
is creating new costs for uh, these universities uh, as they move uh, to invest not only in the uh, the security of the campuses, but also in the physical and, and mental health of the of the students. So I wondered, it can it, can you speak in more detail uh, of how these new costs could impact the resources that HEBCUs are able to put towards uh, academics or or uh, towards other programs that are essential uh, to life. Uh, yes, and thank you so much for that question. Uh, what this does and what these threats do is really expose uh, some of the underlying issues that have been caused by the historical underfunding. And so when you look at these issues, they expose the gaps that we've, been, we've had in our security. They expose gaps we've had in our infrastructure, which does, you know, again, make our campuses more vulnerable. And even gaps we might have in our ability to offer those mental health services to our students. Uh, there's only a finite pool of resources that are available to us. We obviously are going to prioritize our core mission, which is the education, the teaching and learning of our students. But those things that affect teaching and learning, uh, when you have a bomb threat, the ability to offer extra security, uh, the ability to, to upgrade your data systems, those cost uh, additional resources that are just often not available. Uh, so for HBCUs, what you're really looking at is the result of that historical underfunding showing some of the vulnerabilities that come about when you have such a public uh, issue such as the HBCU bomb threats and other potential acts of violence. So again, you know, we have to remain vigilant. We're going to do what's necessary to make sure we always protect our students, but those funding sources have to come from somewhere and often they will be at the expense of our educational endeavors. Thank you for the question. I will add that HBCUs have been systematically underfunded, not only by state legislatures, but also by the federal government. And many HBCUs are land grant institutions. These are schools that were founded by state legislature, that are funded by state legislatures uh, to foster agricultural research and instruction. And often that funding that they receive from state legislatures is in inadequate compared to their white counterparts, black land grant universities have been underfunded by at least $12.8 billion over the last three decades. And funding for land grant institutions is distributed at the discretion of the state legislature. And in many cases, these state legislatures choose to overfund white land grant institutions while barely meeting the required funding for black land grant institutions. And there are specific examples that we cite in our written testimony about the University of Tennessee and the Tennessee General Assembly uh, uh, awarding land-grant dollars in a way that is quite disparate, uh, more than four times the required match of funding that the university should have received. So if you think about the underfunding compounded by the fact that there are unexpected costs imposed by these threats of domestic terror, the financial hit to HBCUs is quite significant. And I will add that many HBCUs, because of the underfunding, are more tuition dependent than other institutions. And the threat of violence on these campuses has the potential to reduce enrollment, has the potential to uh, cast a, a, a chilling effect on the, on the desire of students to attend these institutions that are targeted by violence. And that has the potential to impact not only immediate revenue, but also long-term viability. Thanks. I, I know my time's expired. Thank you for your answers. We are determined that you're not gonna have to go it alone. And we're gonna do everything we can to provide the right resources to back you up. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, I, I'll yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Time has expired. Checker recognized gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to begin by saying that Pastor uh, Manning's uh, message is worthy of an audience in this Congress every day. And the rash of bomb threats against HBCUs is of great concern that occurred that started on January 31, continued through February and into March. Uh, I, I would certainly love to see, I don't know what the law permits, but I understand that there are six persons of interest identified by the FBI or perhaps juveniles. I, I think they I think the nation needs for those persons' identities to be disclosed. 
So I take note of all that. I take note that the, that the gist of the testimony is a plea for resources, and I wanted to ad address an, a related issue. Uh, Ms. Nelson, uh, I have a, a, a tweet here from your Twitter account from March 8, 2021, that retweets an article from The Guardian uh, titled, These U.S. Cities Defunded Police. Quote, we're transferring money to the community. And your tweet text was, the reimagination of public safety includes the reallocation of funds to agencies, services, and community-based nonprofits that are better equipped to protect and served, serve. Um, do you uh, continue today to support defunding police uh, as, as expressed in that tweet? I continue to wholeheartedly support the reimagination of public safety, which means a rethinking of how we allocate resources in ways that better serve all of our communities. We've been talking about a number of mental health issues that pervade society following, not following, we are still in the midst of a pandemic. We also know that police are often stretched and required to respond to matters that are well beyond their professional capacity. Crime solving, investigation of threats of domestic terror like the ones we are discussing today are an appropriate use of funding for law enforcement. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and I'd like a unanimous ask for unanimous consent to submit for the record the tweet and the Guardian article I just referenced. Without object. Um, you know, it's interesting uh, how we end up prioritizing things here in Congress and um, our time and our resources. I, uh, I have an article here from the Washington Post, actually written, originated, originated with Bloomberg on February 23, 2022, that notes that um, in 2020, we saw a 30% increase in homicides across the country, an additional 5,000 deaths across the country, going from 16,425 to 21,570. And if we examine that data with, a, with an, uh, an examination from the perspective of race, it, it's perhaps even worse. Um, the uh, uh, African Americans, uh, it says, uh, make up 13.5% of the U.S. population, but they make up 55.6% of homicide victims and 65.6% of the increase in homicides relative to 2019. Um, and, and I wonder if perhaps we're not missing a bigger issue than, than even this disturbing information about a spate of, of uh, bomb threats against HBCUs. It, we have, so that's, I mean, we're talking about, uh, as the article goes on to say, uh, uh, black Americans in 2020 re represented 13,654 of those homicides across the country, an increase of 3,300. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent to submit this article for the record. Without objection. Um, in the, in the Judiciary Committee yesterday, we had a hearing focused on domestic terrorism with an emphasis on white supremacy. These matters here are certainly uh, animus, race, animus-based uh, crimes, the HBCU attacks. There's a, a hearing in the OGR today on the same thing, but I look back. There's not been a hearing in Congress, in this Congress, about that increase in homicides and the share of that homicide, those homicides that are borne by black Americans. Um, Ms. Nelson, do you believe that the emphasis on reimagining police, as you put it, or defunding police, as others put it, has been responsible for any share of the increase in homicides that black Americans have suffered? No, I don't believe that there's any data, any credible research that links any of the calls to reform our public safety system and any increase in crime. We all know that we are living in the midst of a pandemic that has not only increased economic burdens across society, uh, mental health burdens across society, but there are other ways in which our law enforcement resources are not operating as efficiently as possible. If we look at the crime-solving success of law enforcement, it pales in comparison to the resources that are invested in law enforcement. And I think that is an area worthy of interrogation. Would you say that issue deserves careful examination by Congress, the, the increase in homicides across the country, and particularly that share borne by black Americans? I think that we should be examining crime and what the underlying causes are and looking at the social ills that produce those crimes and addressing those with social policy. 
Thank you, ma'am. My time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman, time has expired. Chair recognizes this young lady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much for um, this um, uh, most uh, crucial and timely hearing. Uh, I am glad, and I'm so glad Mr. Bishop is here. Thank him for his concern, along with our colleagues. And I am enormously gratified uh, that with the leadership of uh, Joseph Biden, the President and Vice President Kamala Harris, and the Congress, we have uh, Chairman Thompson, uh, Chairman Nadler, uh, Chairwoman Jackson Lee over the Crime, Terrorism, Homeland Security Committee that had a similar hearing just a few weeks ago now uh, in oversight. What a difference, finally, the death or the potential death of black people has risen to a level of respect uh, that it should be. For too long, uh, of course, in the sag of the Civil Rights Movement, bodies were strewn across the South and no one cared. Uh, we found the remnants of people who had been killed on dark nights and dark streets uh, because they were black. We saw the civil rights soldiers, including Viola Luizzo and others uh, who were of the majority community, killed violently. Uh, the three boys in Mississippi, whose families still mourn. So this is a preventative hearing, a recognition hearing. And I would offer to say uh, to my friends, uh, justice and holding police accountability accountable is not mutually exclusive. Giving police more resources to, uh, in essence, um, shed those resources to mental health needs and uh, to uh, uh, training needs and to understanding de-escalation and to understand uh, issues uh, dealing with uh, excessive force. There is no crime in that. I'd also uh, commend my good friend to work with me on H.R. 40, the Commission to Study Slavery and Develop Reparation Proposals as it determines uh, the impact on the lives of African Americans today. And I wonder whether or not whether it is a youth or whoever it might be, all of that falls into uh, where we are as people of color in the United States today. Are we the most easily attackable? Are we the most easily vulnerable? Are we the greatest target? And this hearing today, uh, in the short time that I have, uh, says that. I'd like to ask the chairman to submit into the record a letter from Texas Southern University uh, uh, that wrote and said the impact of those attacks uh, those threats on them. I ask unanimous consent. Without objection. They indicate they were born in the midst of segregation, worked tirelessly to build bridges, uh, but they write to indicate that at Texas Southern, the health, safety, and well-being of our students, faculty, and staff is a top priority. Uh, and they indicated that the threat, since the threat happened on the campus, the chief of our campus, Department of Public Safety, has represented all HBCUs. But they realize that this has been a devastating impact on their campus. Their last sentence says, we have come too far to look the other way. Uh, may I ask um, the um, president of Jackson State, uh, and if you can uh, state for me, Mr. President, uh, the deep emotional um, impact on your students and faculty based upon their connection to the movement of civil rights, but the history of their families, and how a bomb threat even is deeper in those students. And then I'd appreciate if Pastor Manning, I came to Charleston, we've been fighting for the Charleston loophole through your great leader, uh, Mr. Clyburn. Um, if you would tell me the impact on your parishioners even today. President Hudson. Yes, thank you so much, Congresswoman Jackson Lee. Uh, and you are correct in terms of that impact, the emotional impact on our students, our faculty and staff, and really the entire JSU family. Uh, you know, those threats, as I remind people, you know, I live on the campus, and those threats affect me and my family uh, as well. And what it does is it's meant to disrupt that learning process. It's meant to disrupt uh, the progress uh, HBCUs have made over the years. You know, it's no secret that these threats 
coincided not only with the start of Black History Month, but they also coincided with the fact that HBCUs have had somewhat of a reawakening in the eyes of many in terms of our importance, in terms of the value that we bring uh, to this great nation. And these threats was meant to deter that, they were meant to diminish those accomplishments. Uh, at Jackson State University, we're also gonna be, always gonna be mindful of that direct lineage between some of the incidents in the past, Congressman Thompson referenced the 1970 shootings, uh, which we still acknowledge on a yearly basis, uh, all the way up to today with these current persistent threats. It shows us why we must always remain vigilant, we must always be prepared, we must be proactive in addressing these issues so that we're ready when these inevitable situations come about. So our goal at Jackson State is to always be ready on call uh, to deal with these issues while also making sure that our students, the mental health, and the overall emotional impact is accounted for as well. Mr. Pastor? No. Pastor? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, thank you. So the, the attacks, of course, um, that we still see even today um, impact the congregation in many ways. Uh, it takes us right back to the horrific act that we suffered here on June 17, 2015, and it continues to rob the members of the congregation the safety that is needed uh, when they come to worship. So from that particular perspective, as I believe I did say in the testimony, that there are still several members who still have not been able to return even to this date. Uh, and that continues to rob many members of their right to just worship God in spirit and in truth and in freedom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. you. General ladies, time has expired. Chair Thank recognizes you. gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins. I thank the chairman and the ranking member for holding this hearing today. Um, Mr. Chairman, as a police officer, I've, I've personally responded to many bomb threats. I say many, probably eight or 10 during the course of my career. And it, it's always, you know, a mischievous, young, disturbed man or girl that's calling these threats in and, and you know, you generally get past the clearing of the building and order is restored and the institutions, business continues, it's usually a school. But the lingering fear and the impact of that, of that uh, criminal action is, is a particular concern and I, I appreciate the hearing held today. I, I just left an oversight hearing focused on the same issue, same issue, because it deserves attention. We, we must put this in perspective as a nation historically, especially regarding our historically black universities and, and churches, uh, because there's, there's just no place for fear to exist as a, as a, a common factor for our citizenry. It, it's, it should not be a consideration that any American uh, has to deal with on a regular basis. It should be rare, and then it should, it should be aggressively investigated. In South Louisiana, very recently, a couple of years ago, we had three historically black churches burned to the ground in a very short period of time. Many of you maybe recall that. There's a tremendous amount of media about it because any reasonable man looking at those burnings would, 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 would presume this is likely a hate crime racially motivated. Well, the investigation moved forward very effectively by local and state law enforcement. They were closing in on identifying a subject. When the father of the, of the suspect he figured out it was his son. The father was professional law enforcement. And he turned his son in, brought his son in. Investigation revealed that it was, it was not a racially motivated hate crime. It was a religiously motivated hate crime. 
This young man had been indoctrinated into some kind of a bizarre satanic belief system and wanted to videotape the, the falling of a steeple into flame. So, of course, the media went away because it didn't quite fit the narrative. But the impact has been long-lasting. And our law enforcement agencies have, have a specific duty to respond aggressively to these, these threats and actions. Uh, Reverend Manning, if, you, if you're with us, sir, I'd like to ask you specifically, your church and your congregation of children of God have been impacted specifically. And I'd like to know, as a result of the attack recently, can you share with this committee, and I'll give you the balance of my time, uh, best practices and security measures that your congregation has to now deal with? And what would you recommend uh, to your fellow churches across the nation, reflective of your own experience, Reverend? Well, again, thank you. So the best practices that I would say is is plan. Uh, and we did talk about that briefly in our testimony uh, to develop detailed security plans. Unfortunately, this is the world that we are in right now. Uh, always being aware of your surroundings, making sure uh, that you have enough cameras on place uh, that would be able to record uh, the various activities that are coming around your your places and your houses of worship. Uh, it, it is a sad state, and and unfortunately, as I said before, it is something that we deal with here on a daily basis. Uh, when mail comes, sometimes I, as I look over on my left side of my desk, uh, there is what I call love mail. Uh, of course, that is not really love; it's hate mail that I get. Uh, from various people throughout the country, uh, and that we are never really prepared for. So we just have to continue to do what we, uh, to do the best thing that we possibly can, which is to be mindful of our surroundings, uh, have the uh, wherewithal to make sure that we have the security plan, and as well, as we've already articulated, making sure that there are enough financial resources uh, that are able to undergird those churches in the rural communities. Uh, thank you, Reverend, and, and my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Gentlemen, yields. Chair, recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Payne, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Nelson, uh, as you've been made aware, threats that uh, Black institutions face today are not new. Black churches, for example, have been terrorized long before we were ever using the term domestic violent extremists. Uh, you discussed this in your testimony, but uh, can you elaborate on how uh, threats to Black institutions have evolved over time? Certainly. Uh, thank you for the question. Black institutions have been threatened since their inception. And if we think about black institutions in a very broad sense, we can go as far back as thinking about the burning of Tulsa. We can think about the burning of Greenwood. We can think about the deconstruction of any signs of black progress, any establishments that reject the notion of white supremacy and black inferiority. Our black churches are an exemplar of black resilience and stand at the center of black communities throughout our nation. Our black HBCUs are also an exemplar of black excellence and the ability of black people to learn together in a safe and nurturing environment, independent and resilient. It is those institutions that are the targets and have been the targets over time of white extremist violence. We are seeing an uptick in hate crimes, an uptick in the creation of white extremist groups. And these institutions are a ready-made target for those individuals and entities. It is essential, therefore, that these entities have the ability to protect themselves and to build the necessary infrastructure 
to secure the populations that attend these institutions. But it is also not only for those individuals, this is an investment that this country should make because these institutions are essential to its historical identity and to its present diversity. So that is why we are calling upon Congress to invest as many resources as possible to ensure that these institutions are viable, that they are safe, and that they continue to contribute to the fabric of our broader American society. And in what ways would you connect uh, the attacks on black institutions to the larger universe of threats posed by white supremacy and extreme uh, right-wing ideology? Well, I connect them directly because right now we are in the midst of an assault on truth. We're in the midst of an attempt to erase the lived experiences of black Americans and people of color. And it's not only black people who are under severe attack. As we see, there have been many instances of violence against Asian American and Pacific Islander persons in this country, against people from various religious backgrounds, synagogues, mosques, places of uh, learning and, and worship have been targeted. But we do know that black institutions have endured this unfortunate uh, legacy of violence for their entire existence. And it is now escalating at a time when we should have evolved as a society towards a more peaceful and respectful um, uh, coexistence. And that is the reason that we demand that Congress address this issue before we find ourselves uh, in a more retrogressive state. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. We have to continue to uh, explore these um, these incidents and 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 continue to bolster uh, the um, support that this committee gives to um, the homeland and institutions here in this country, um, uh, and try to understand why, since their inception, um, these black institutions have not been uh, given the opportunity to um, ever thrive as other uh, groups have in this nation. And with that, I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Iowa, Ms. Miller Meeks, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ranking Member Katko and our witnesses who are here. Um, I, like many others, were horrified at what uh, began to transpire uh, at the beginning of this year, but as has been indicated, is not the first time and none of us want uh, our children, our young adults, to um, you know, attend college uh, and fear for their safety, or a synagogue, or a church, or even walking to their elementary school. Uh, so we're horrified at that, and um, we're pleased that you're here to offer your testimony to us. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas, along with uh, Education Secretary Cardona, met with HBCUs on January 24th, 2022, to discuss grant programs, training resources, research opportunities, and other tools available to increase campus safety and security. And in fact, they heavily prioritize campus safety and they offer a cadre of um, tools that are available. Were you um, or a representative, uh, doc, uh, Mr. Hudson, Dr. Hudson um, of Jackson State present at that meeting? And if so, what DH, DHS grants, programs, and trainings did Secretary Mayorkas discuss with you that may be helpful? Uh, yes, we were. Uh, we did have a representative present at that meeting, and there were a multitude of opportunities. Uh, the nonprofit grant program uh, that you know allows for us to make those security enhancements, those campus upgrades, particularly with respect to data science. As I've mentioned earlier, uh, being able to upgrade our ability to monitor to store the type of historical data we need to make those continuous assessments on our campus is necessary. Uh, you know, as I said from the outset, we are thankful to law enforcement for their response, but it was just that, it was response. Uh, being proactive means doing those types of things, doing the type of infrastructural improvements, uh, the cybersecurity data uh, science improvements necessary to be proactive and necessary to help us mitigate those risks before they happen. And that is the space that we wanna move in. 
that's where historical underfunding really makes an impact on your ability to be proactive. So those programs uh, mentioned uh, by Secretary Mayorkas and Secretary Cardona were necessary, and we at Jackson State are in the process of applying for several of those uh, in order to enhance our ability to, again, proactively uh, mitigate some of those issues before we get into a response mode. So uh, I was unclear if you had uh, developed or utilized the on online trainings that were offered, but yes. uh, in, in one of your comments, uh, Tugaloo College, one of the uh, victims of this year's slew of bomb threats, is a recipient of FEMA's nonprofit security grant program funds, having received 150000 for safety and security in fiscal year 2021. Are you aware of the 501c3 Jackson State and other nonprofit HBCUs that are eligible for this type of fun funding, and did you apply? Uh, we are aware of that type of funding, and we, have, we are applying for those funds. Yes, ma'am. Great. And then how can Congress support HBCUs applying for security grant funding to ensure applications are successful? Well, and, that, and that's the most important part because there are a multitude of programs out there, grant opportunities out there. But in terms of capacity, you know, there's a human capital that's needed in order to make a successful application. So workshops such as the ones you mentioned are very important. Uh, us participating in those ongoing efforts, the program support that those funding agencies offer are very critical in helping guide our institutions in terms of making a successful application. So I'm glad you brought that up because that is the next step. Once those funding opportunities are out there, how can we work with HBCUs and other institutions to improve their ability to successfully navigate the actual process in order to successfully obtain those funds that are so very needed? Uh, at Jackson State, we try to take advantage of every opportunity, uh, you know, whether it's uh, any type of learning opportunity, uh, any type of webinar that helps us successfully navigate those processes, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, so to the extent they do offer those, we do take advantage of those. Yeah, as a former director of public health, we certainly offer them when it comes to health-related programs mm -hmm. so that there is training to increase your capacity to apply for grant programs. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Mr. Chair, I yield back my time. Thank you, General Lady yields back. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from California for five minutes, Mr. Correa. I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member for this most important hearing. I want to thank our witness here today uh, for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you talked a little bit about sanctuaries, and it's interesting today to think about a safe place in our society. It's not our home anymore, not a church. It's not a school or a university. Just last Friday, I was at home and got alerted to a bomb threat. Santa Ana High School, 3,300 students, bomb threat, school locked down. For those moments, I can tell you everybody in my community was praying for a good outcome. We did have a good outcome, but to think of those moments that it took for the police to get to the school even though we have police at the school, it wasn't enough. In those sheer moments, we realized we had holes in the system. Those few precious minutes make a difference between saving lives and not. I do believe, I agree with both of our witnesses, that this investment is an investment well made. The tragedy of something horrible happening, the toll, the human cost, and of course, the psychological cost of knowing that you always got to look behind you. You always got to try to figure out if you're safe. <clears throat> That's not America. But we have to change it back to what America was. This funding goes a long way. And my specific question to our witnesses here today is, how well do you work with the local public agencies? We have these things called fusion centers with local public you know, police, FBI, other groups work together. Do you feel like you have communication with these groups? Do you feel like there's a two-way conversation here to make sure that we prevent the unspeakable from happening? Thank you. Yes, we do. Uh, we've developed wonderful relationships with our local, our state, and our federal law enforcement agencies. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, response, as I said before, 
uh, they were very much involved uh, in helping us get through uh, what was a pretty scary time when you have a bomb threat at that time, you know, four o'clock in the morning is when it happened to us. Uh, but again, the need to be proactive, the need to continue those conversations, the need to engage in those opportunities to build our capacity and utilizing their expertise and helping us do so is the next step that we do have to take in terms of those relationships. Mr. Hudson, I believe you don't leave any stone unturned when it comes to being proactive. What I coulda, shoulda. No second chances to look back. What is it that you need? What is it that you think we need to do to make sure that we cover the most obvious basis when it comes to safety of our children and of our community? Well, the first thing we need when we talk about funding uh, it has to start with a plan. Uh, we're working with our local law enforcement, with the federal agencies, with the state agencies. What is the plan for Jackson State if and when a situation such as this occurs? Obviously, we have safety protocols and measures in place, but the plan has to be inclusive of that tiered approach that I discussed earlier. Campus infrastructure, how do we make our campus as a whole, the actual property more secure? How do we work in terms of training? making sure that our officers are trained in such a way that their response, you know, is appropriate for the, uh, for the actual situation. And again, how do we work on the after effects? You know, what are some of the steps we take to mitigate the damage that's done as it relates to our students? Ms. Nelson, I'll let you take your drink. Go ahead, thank you. <laughs> Any thoughts? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the need to uh, protect schools, as, as you suggested. And one of the things that I don't think we've emphasized enough in this conversation is the need to prosecute these crimes as hate crimes and to recognize them as the, uh, uh, as the, the vehicles for racial animus that they are. That's also a potential deterrent. Uh, we certainly don't want these crimes to occur but it is important that we send a message immediately when they do or even when they are simply threatened because that is a form of domestic terror and that is an opportunity to send a broader message that these types of crimes and these threats of violence will not be tolerated. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Out of time, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair recognizes the Gentleman from Mississippi for five minutes, Mr. Guest. Well, good afternoon. I want to thank you all for visiting with us to participate. I'm glad to see you, great to have you on the campus. I thank you for your service and your leadership at Jackson State University. Plow some of the things that are going on there, some of the, uh, some of the, uh, con uh, things that y'all are doing, uh, along with some of the other universities in Mississippi, uh, you make myself and uh, Congressman Thompson extremely proud to uh, represent our great state. And congratulations on a great football season. Uh, I wish you would have brought Coach Prime with you, uh, but maybe next time that you're here, uh, he can join you. Um, just want to ask you a little bit, tell us a little bit and just let me know, these recent threats uh, that y'all received, um, the impact, one, that it had on the university, uh, the faculty, the students, uh, and then also talk to me a little bit about uh, the law enforcement response uh, and, and the things uh, that they did uh, after this was reported. And so if you could just share those with me for a few minutes, I would greatly appreciate that. Okay. Thank you so much. And I uh, certainly thank you for uh, your well wishes. Uh, you know, in terms of the impact, I think it's important to remember that once, you know, when you do the sweep, you determine that the immediate threat is not there as it relates to the bomb, uh, the impact remains. The impact of the thought that this can happen to your campus, this can happen on your campus. There are enough examples in history of these things having been executed successfully. Acts of terrorism have been executed successfully for us to always remain vigilant no matter what was the outcome of that specific situation uh, on that day. For Jackson State University, uh, February 1st was a day that reminded us that we're always under threat. There's always the threat of attack, and we always have to remain vigilant for what could happen. Uh, with respect to our federal, state, and local law enforcement, I couldn't be happier and more thankful to them for the way they responded. Uh, again, not only in words, but in action. Uh, specifically, the FBI uh, special agent in charge, uh, Jermichael Fomby, uh, 
I was able to call him and talk to him personally and get his personal assurances that the FBI was on top of it, they were aware of everything that was happening, and really get his personal assurance that we had his full support. Uh, with the state of Mississippi Capitol Police, you know, I was able to talk to um, the associate commissioner, uh, Keith Davis, who actually sent a couple of units to campus to help assist our patrols and to supplement our police efforts. Uh, the city of Jackson did the actual sweep and was able to do so in a way that allowed us to reopen that same day. Obviously, there was some disruption, there was some lingering anxiety and concern, but they did um, their jobs in such a professional way that we were able to somewhat mitigate the disruption to the learning process. And of course, again, our own uh, you know, campus police, as they do every day, made sure that they, were, they swept the campus, made sure that we're safe. Moving forward, when we look at solutions, uh, I can't talk enough about infrastructure. You hear me talk, say that often, but the campus itself has to be designed in a way that um, encourages safety uh, and encourages the security of our students. Uh, that means because we sit in an urban area, which again adds to the culture of the campus, and we're very proud to sit in the heart of Jackson, Mississippi, but because we sit in that area, we do have to take additional steps to decrease the vulnerability that that brings with it. Uh, the open access, uh, some of the various ways, uh, the thoroughfares through campus. And that is really the next step for Jackson State to take. And again, I also can't emphasize enough the ability to provide training for our officers, um, the ability to provide the type of training for our faculty, staff, and students. What do you do when these situations occur? Uh, I'm in where I started that there have been enough successful examples of these type of threats being executed for us to always remain vigilant of the threat, uh, even though, again, these individuals were apprehended and we're thankful for that, but the threat remains and we have to remain forever vigilant. And I'll be right. sure to send Coach Prime your well wishes. Yes, sir. And, and you talk a little bit about infrastructure, uh, training for uh, campus police, uh, and then uh, as far as technology, uh, things uh, that would be beneficial there for the security of the campus. Uh, can you just talk very briefly? I've only got about 30 seconds. Uh, the chairman may allow me to go over very briefly, but can you talk about maybe some technology needs that you have there at Jackson State where the federal government can partner with your campus uh, to make sure that you, you have those needs met? Yeah, one of the things, you know, when we talk about those advanced security monitoring systems, uh, you know, one of the effects of underfunding is that we possess those security data capture systems but we do so with limited bandwidth, uh, sometimes older technology. And what that does is doesn't allow us that continuous monitoring, doesn't allow us that long-term storage that allows us to do the type of threat assessments that you can do when you have the historical data. That's one specific area where uh, we really need to upgrade, and that is an expense uh, that most, most institutions just cannot cover in their normal operating budget. Also, you look at things like the increase of uh, insurance costs. You know, it costs a lot more oftentimes to be in the areas that we are, especially when you have a threat such as this. Uh, institutions have to cover those things. And so again, these things that fall outside your normal operating budget, which are already pretty stretched in, uh, these, things, these things that are outside of the normal expertise of an institution of higher learning, how do we work with the Department of Homeland Security? How do we work with the Department of Justice, uh, law enforcement agencies to uh, ensure that we have the funding we need to expand our capacity in those specific areas? Uh, thank you again, President Hus Hudson, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, he yields back. Chair recognizes the young lady from Michigan, Ms. Slotkin. Thank you, Mr. Minutes. Chairman. Welcome to our witnesses. Thanks for being here on this topic. Um, I'm from Michigan, and this this topic is is very relevant for a whole bunch of reasons. One, because we are we just announced that we're restarting uh, HBCU in Detroit, um, and it, it and uh, so. We will join the, the legions of states who are proud to have those institutions, but also because we've had a real problem with um, racially motivated attacks and incidents um, in, in our state. In, uh, in one of my counties, Ingham County, we had 26 incidents against churches in the last two years. We've had repeated problems with Zoom bombing where literally white supremacists jump onto a Zoom during COVID. Um, uh, show pictures of uh, people giving the Nazi salute and start 
basically attacking via chat um, the pastors, the leaders. Um, in addition to our African American institutions, um, we've had uh, mosques, uh, uh, you know, violent incidents at mosques. Um, we've had our Hillel at, at Michigan State attacked. It's just we've had a lot of these incidents. And it really struck me that a lot of the leaders of these institutions have had to become security professionals in addition to the spiritual leader or the um, uh, you know, senior educational leader at these institutions. So can you talk about, um, you know, in uh, Mr. Hudson, in your role, um, just kind of how you have to do your job differently because you have to think about security all the time. Uh, and that is a that is a great point. Uh, you do have to think about those things that one would consider outside of the normal uh, purview, if you will, of a higher ed leader. Uh, but when you think about it, when you house students on your campus, uh, when you have students who are there 24-7, that's where they live, security becomes a heightened priority mm -hmm. for your institutions. And for Jackson State University, it has to be first and foremost. How can we create the proper environment where our students can learn, where they can be nurtured, where they can, whether they can thrive? Uh, these types of threats disrupt uh, that effort, our effort to provide those things. So again, we have to become security personnel. So when we do that by making sure, first of all, we have people around us uh, who have the expertise, you know, in terms of campus public safety. We also make sure we do that by partnering with our local, our state, our federal law enforcement agencies uh, to ensure that we have the proper connections and the proper partnerships mm -hmm. that help us expand our capacity and our ability to secure the campus. And again, we work with uh, the Department of Homeland Security, you know, our efforts with the Department, uh, with the Office of Academic Engagement allows us again to expand our capacity, expand our expertise through training, through academic programming that helps us become a part of that solution needed to deal with those various issues. Uh, and the other part we have to make sure we talk about is the mental health aspect. Mm -hmm. How do we expand our services on the mental health side to make sure that our students, uh, the anxiety that comes with being under the potential of attack, if you will, how do we help our students deal with that while they're still doing the normal things, going to class, you know, participating in campus activities? How do we make sure that's a part of the process as well? So it's a holistic, multi-tiered approach uh, that you do have to take as a campus administrator in order to deal with these types of issues. Yeah, it just strikes me that for, for institutions, um, universities, colleges, and, and religious institutions that have to, that's, they sort of have to build in um, and price out the additional costs associated with security, physical security, but then also all the work that goes into making people feel, as you say, sort of mentally safe. Um, and, you know, this committee, I think, has been a strong supporter of the nonprofit security grants, you know, these grants for institutions. Um, but it's just sad that we have to have those grants um, and that, um, uh, there's just this added tax on being a targeted institution in this day and age, and, and um, I, I appreciate your work on that. Um, I, I will also say I think one of, sadly, um, in, in Michigan, one of the ways that this security threat has played out is that different religious and ethnic groups have been helping each other as new groups become victims of new security threats. We had a, a, a number of incidents at one of my large mosques and we brought in the Jewish community who knows you know, very well on how to secure their institutions. Um, and it's, it's sad, but um, uh, I do think that it's an area where unfortunately um, we have to help each other across lines. And I, I just appreciate you coming here and speaking to your experience um, because it, it is something that unfortunately many, many institutions have to be thinking about. So with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Maybe the Methodists and Baptists can get together in Mississippi. <laughs> uh, chair recognized the gentleman uh, from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Am I audible? Yes, you on. We hear you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for, for this hearing and uh, one, of, one of the things I want to make sure that the uh, presidents, the university presidents uh, uh, of uh, HBCUs understand is that last year due uh, in no small part to Congressman Bobby Scott of Virginia, uh, we were able to get record amounts of, of funding for HBCUs. Uh, he did an amazing job and I, I, I think uh, 
uh, all of you uh, have probably been informed about the tremendous uh, increases that he was able to get uh, uh, through uh, his committee as, as the chair of education. And uh, we're all uh, members proud of it. I, I want to go back to uh, an issue earlier, and I, don't, and I hate we're getting off the subject, but, but sometimes, uh, you know, we, we just have to respond. And, um, you know, I, I think this whole issue of uh, talking about defunding the police uh, has given some people uh, a license to mis misrepresent, uh, maybe maybe even misunderstand. But uh, to the to the panel, uh, do do you see as uh, synonyms uh, defund the police uh, uh, and reengineering, redesign, uh, reimagine uh, uh, as either um, uh, words that are, are, are synonyms uh, or they are uh, interchangeable. Ms. Nelson, we're going to let you take that. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry. The counselor, yes. So if the question is whether those concepts are interchangeable, I, I don't think I can, I can answer that. I think they mean different things to different people. And there may be some common themes. I think the one theme and thread uh, among all of those phrases and intentions is that something is broken in our public safety system. Something is broken and it needs to be fixed. And there are many different ways in which people are suggesting we go about it. But we saw that millions of, Mer of Americans uh, in 2020 agreed with the notion that our public safety system is broken. And they did so in powerful protests, peaceful protests throughout this country that reverberated on a global scale. So I do think that there is something resonant in, in all of those slogans that just indicates that we have a significant problem to address. And this gives me an opportunity to share some research that the Legal Defense Fund did recently in response to this notion about an increase in crime and the idea that that is somehow uh, uh, linked to a decrease in law enforcement or cries for reform of law enforcement. Our Thurgood Marshall Institute conducted research analyzing homicide trends in 61 major U.S. cities. And we drew samples from the 100 most popular cities in, in the U.S. as well. And according to our research, cities with higher levels of economic inequality experienced the higher increases in homicides. So when we talk about crime, it's very important that we look in the direction of what the underlying social conditions are that produce a, a rise in crime or produce crimes more generally. And the focus is not an idea of thinking differently about law enforcement and public safety. The focus should be on thinking about the economic inequality, the health disparities, and the other social conditions that lead to crime and violence. I appreciate that, I, and I hate that we have to get into that direction, but I'm not a linguistics or a lexicologist, but I, I, I do know that you can't just, somebody can't take a, a, a word and uh, or a phrase, and then uh, uh, attach some other meaning to it. And uh, I, I think that's unfortunate uh, that has happened. And so, uh, you know, we, this is a serious problem. I, I get hit on both sides. I'm a graduate of an HBCU, and I'm going into my 42nd year as a seminary trained, ordained United Methodist pastor. Uh, and I know the money that we have to spend now uh, at our church for security. Uh, and also understand the, 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 the trauma that many of the students and faculty of HBCUs have experienced. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, not, not just for the, the, the hearing, but I think making sure that this uh, th this issue does not melt away as so many do. Thank you very much, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, yields back. Chair recognized gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member as well. I thank the witnesses for appearing. I think the hearing has been most informative and quite beneficial. 
I'd like to address just a few comments to the representative from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, just for edification purposes, um, many people may not know, and I think it's worthy of mentioning at this hearing, this institution was founded by the Honorable Thurgood Marshall, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. And um, I want to thank you, Ms. Nelson, for your position with the organization. I was uh, an NAACP branch president for about a decade and have some sense of the difficulties uh, that we encounter when we attempt to uh, use these grant applications. Uh, sometimes they can be very difficult to negotiate. So I thought I'd ask you a couple of questions related to the grant application process. Um, I'm concerned about um, the difficulties you may be having. Is there any difficulty that you would call to my attention that uh, I might be able to help you with or we might be able to help you with in terms of making it easier to negotiate the grant application process? Well, thank you very much, Representative Green, for acknowledging the Legal Defense Fund and its and its founder, Thurgood Marshall. Uh, I will defer to Mr. Hudson to talk about the grant application process as the Legal Defense Fund is not presently applying for a grant application. But we do note that there are institutions, other institutions, other nonprofits that uh, want to take advantage of this program. And we support the increase in funding and the act uh, that that is on the floor today that would increase funding to the NSGP to $500 million for each fiscal year from 2023 to 2028, which we believe is a very necessary intervention as black institutions continue to be subject to hateful attacks across the country. Thank you so well, much. I will, I'm going to yield to you in just a second, but let me uh, add something. Uh, I too support H.R. 6825 and would like to acknowledge the chairman, Chairman Thompson, and the ranking member, Catco, for uh, putting this before us. Uh, I'm a co-sponsor of it, and uh, I appreciate your, your being more specific as it relates to this legislation. Yes, sir, I, I now yield to you. Thank you so much. And uh, I must say that one welcome development um, of the increase in funding is that it allows uh, more institutions uh, to be served by these uh, funding opportunities. Uh, it becomes less of a competition and more of a need-based uh, system where, you know, if your application is successful, if you demonstrate the need, you have a really good chance of receiving that funding. So that, that's definitely a plus. Uh, the other part is uh, the funding agencies, especially I would say over the last couple of years, have been really good and they've really, uh, you know, increased their efforts to help our institutions navigate that application process, uh, navigate uh, the bureaucracy, if you will, that comes along with applying these funds, applying for these funds and actually receiving these funds. Uh, so we've been excited by that development. Uh, we've taken advantage of as many of those that are possible, and uh, it has helped our institutions receive more funding than we have in the past. We would just like to see that continue. We would like to see the availability, the pool of funds continue to increase, and we would like to see those outreach efforts continue that allow us to better uh, access those funds, better navigate the application process, uh, and, and continue to work to build our capacity. Because in the end, this is about capacity building, building our capacity in terms of today's subject matter to better protect our campuses and to be more proactive in assessing and determining these threats before they actually happen. Well, one of the aspects of this legislation that I'm excited about is that it provides feedback to nonprofits that do not receive grants. Can you comment on the importance of that feedback, please, sir? Yes, because uh, obviously, you know, if you don't receive uh, funding, uh, at least on your initial application, you do want to come back. You do want to reapply for those funds because the need, the need still exists. So that feedback is important because it tells you the strengths and weaknesses of your application and it allows you to go back, sort of recalibrate your efforts and really put forth a better effort in terms of application process. Also, it provides just that one-to-one -one connectivity between your institution and that funding agency that allows you to look at other programs, that allows you to have access to other 
opportunities that may be different than the one that you apply for and would maybe reject it from. So those are definitely welcome efforts. Again, it's part of that outreach, which I talked about, that we have seen an increase in recently. Uh, our goal is to make sure that continues and to make sure the availability of those resources, the pool of resources, continue to increase also so more institutions uh, can be assisted by these funds. Thank you. My time has expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield back and thank you for making it clear that uh, black lives do matter by having this hearing. Thank you very much. Chair, I recognize the young lady from New Jersey, Ms. Watson Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for uh, convening us today. I want to thank you and the ranking member for the legislation that we were considering that will increase the resources to uh, these institutions um, to ensure that they are safer and, and have access to healthier environments, whether or not it's your worship environment or your educational environment. Um, I'm gonna appreciate the fact that my, the members of this uh, committee have asked a very diverse uh, questions and they basically have um, covered the kind of areas that I was concerned about. What sticks out for me very much is this though. And I think Mr. Hudson kind of put this in my, in my, in my head. When we asked him about needs for his campus, he said something about the traditional and historic underfunding, um, that there's at least a $10 million need to sort of harden his campus or make it safer for uh, his students to learn. And so I'm interested in ensuring that there are buckets or, or, or pots of money uh, resources that are available to our institutions to make their campuses safer from an infrastructure perspective. Another thing was the sort of systems, technology, training, uh, things of that nature. We need to make sure that those uh, buckets of money um, e exist or the money or the, uh, the pro programs that are created under the legislation we already have allows for this. And uh, lastly, I'm very concerned about the whole mental health issues, both on the campuses and, you know, Reverend Manning raising those issues with regard to his church and members who haven't even come back to church since that horrible experience um, nine years ago. I need to know if there are su sufficient resources for mental health um, services to both parishioners from the from our church perspectives and from our colleges. And lastly, I just want to say just sort of generally that hate crimes in this country really target uh, Blacks, Asians, Latinos, um, LGBTQ, and anybody else that the, the white supremacists think are just not worthy of our respect and our protection. And I wanna make sure that we have the resources available, that we're not having to uh, compete against one another for inadequate resources in, 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 um, in total. And so I just would like to ask if um, Reverend Manning, Pastor Manning would just comment on the sort of emotional and mental impact, this mental health impact. Um, the incident had on his congregation and what it means to his congregation. Thank you for the uh, question. The the impact, of course, you have initially uh, the struggles with having uh, trauma uh, impacting a sacred place of worship. Uh, and then uh, we did have a grant in conjunction with MUSC that only lasted for three years. The problem with the grant in that particular perspective is it was kind of short term. I uh, did not necessarily give people just enough time to realistically come to grips with how they are feeling. Uh, and it's only been recently that several members have started to open up the door and allow me to even share with them uh, in regard of how they can continuously heal. And that's why I said before uh, in my testament, that's a long term. I, I do not know how long it will ever take uh, members to heal from a mental health perspective, from a trauma perspective, uh, especially as we are uh, now living in an age where there are other attacks that are coming up against houses of worship. 
So the mental health component, I think, is very important. Uh, it's one that we realize from a spiritual formation perspective, and it's one that we have to continue to uh, be there to help uh, as time goes on. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. And another thought is that um, the trauma that's associated with active shooter training. While necessary, I understand uh, the reluctance that you all have had in engaging in it, but it certainly is part of our readiness, our preparation. And so I just sort of raise that for both you and for Mr. Hudson and um, commit to you that I will work very hard to ensure that you have the resources that you need in order to ensure that we can worship safely and that we can educate our children and that our faculty and our administration in both the churches and the and, and our colleges are sufficiently um, prepared and protected as well. Thank you. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Chair recognizes General Lady from the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fluger, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone, all the witnesses and uh, participants today uh, in this important hearing. I, I think I'll focus on my role on this committee, which is as the ranking member of intelligence and counterterrorism and trying to, you know, be in the business of making sure that our communications uh, between the federal, local and state law enforcement uh, entities are, uh, are continue to be strong, that we have, um, you know, good information. Uh, I, I hope that as a result as well as a byproduct of this hearing that that all of us um, We'll stand united in, uh, in condemning acts of violence throughout the United States, regardless of, uh, of, of where they occur. And obviously, it's unacceptable uh, for any of those to happen. So, again, thank you for being here. Um, you know, the, recently, the, United, the Intel uh, and Counterterrorism and the Emergency Preparedness Response and Recovery Subcommittees held a joint hearing. Um, and that was based on securing the American uh, houses of worship with a specific interest in the Jewish community. Um, in that hearing, our members really learned uh, that through the Jewish Secure Communities Network, uh, that those facilities are able to share information on threats with each other and with law enforcement. And I, I'm very interested to know, um, you know, if there's anything similar, if there's any sort of communications mechanism and how um, the colleges and universities are able to communicate with each other and with local and and state law, uh, local, state, and, and federal entities um, to make sure that we are uh, staying vigilant. So uh, anybody can answer that. Uh, President Hudson, if, if you're uh, able to answer that, uh, I'll, I'll yield to anybody that wants to take a shot at that. Uh, yes, and uh, thank you so much for your question. And you're absolutely right uh, that coordination between uh, the universities um, that were affected and really all universities and those law enforcement entities is vital. Uh, at Jackson State, we've been fortunate uh, to have great communication uh, with all levels of law enforcement uh, and great support from those entities. Uh, the next step, and we have hosted uh, several summits on our campus related to you know, the local issues as it relates to crime, uh, criminal justice, but really the next step is making sure we do have those convenings, those regular convenings in which we review where we are, review our planning, review those threat assessments, make sure that we're always vigilant. Uh, as I said, as wonderful as the response was from our local law enforcement agencies, it was response by its very nature. We wanna be proactive. We wanna make sure that before uh, there's a threat, we're always in communication, we're always in that constant planning mode, and we're always on the same page so we can mitigate even the possibility of the threat and certainly the potential fallout. Uh, I will say again that enough of these threats have become real uh, and have become real acts of violence to, for us to not ever uh, take them lightly. We always have to take them seriously and part of taking them seriously is making sure that we're always in constant communication and coordination with our local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies uh, to really ensure uh, that we are doing the t things and taking the steps needed to protect our campuses. Yeah, thank you, President Hudson. Does anybody else have a different opinion uh, as far as uh, any of the, the witnesses? No, the only thing, and thank you for that question, I think the only thing that we have to continue continuously do is to build those lines of communication, um, even within all of our churches. 
of the work that we've done already as well with the Tree of Life after uh, their horrific act uh, back in October of uh, 2019. It, it was immensely uh, beneficial uh, to be able to come and to share with them. And I think realistically, when we can share all of the communications together, uh, then that helps uh, in aiding all the houses of worship, uh, knowing first and foremost that they're not alone. And then secondly, uh, that there are folks out there who have uh, trailblazed uh, the way as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Reverend. Thank you, uh, President Hudson. I, I think you, your words uh, and your testimony are, are salient to us that we should always be vigilant of threats. It's really sad that, that we have to even talk about this, to be honest. Uh, it, it is very sad to me. But Mr. Chairman, I, I hope that as a result of this, what this committee will do um, is take these words, take these uh, witnesses uh, testimony today um, and take this situation and apply it to um, not only this particular specific situation, but also to the greater security needs of our country, uh, that the information sharing, whether it's our southern border or whether it's uh, terrorism abroad, that we will do everything we possibly can to uh, to secure this country uh, and use the words that we just heard from uh, the Reverend and, and the President. Uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. As you know, that's part of the charge of this committee to do just that. And I look forward to uh, a cooperative effort to make sure that we accomplish it. Uh, the chair recognizes the lady from Florida, Ms. Demons, for five minutes. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for reminding us of our charge, or certainly our primary responsibility is the safety and security of our nation. I have not forgotten that. But today we are here to talk about domestic ter terrorist threats against black institutions, houses of worship and HBCUs. I think our children being threatened and worshipers is worth staying very focused and giving the uh, just amount of time and attention uh, to that matter. I wanna thank our witnesses for being here uh, with us today as well. Uh, uh, Reverend Manning, you described the violence against Mother Emanuel, and it's, it's good to see you. I wish it was under different circumstances as a deliberate and sinful act rooted in hate. I just want to repeat those words because I want this committee to stay very focused on why we're here. President Hudson, you uh, stated that the threats against HBCUs are a deliberate attempt to destroy these cultural spaces where intellect and diverse thought thrives. Uh, Reverend uh, Manny, following up on the $50,000 that you uh, indicated that Mother Emanuel had to spend on security in recent years, I'm just curious, have you received any outreach at all from any federal offices about programs that might assist your church in providing security at your church? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I already articulated that we did receive a partial grant with MUSC, but that was from a trauma perspective. From a security perspective, uh, we have not. Uh, and a lot of times within uh, the, the, the church situation, uh, there may be some delay in receiving uh, information regarding if those grants are indeed available. And, and I think that's something that we definitely have to work through. Yeah, I think it's just almost unbelievable. I mean, the nation watched and quite frankly, probably the world watched the vicious attack against the pastor and the worshipers there. I, I find it almost unbelievable that no federal uh, agency reached out uh, with regard to uh, security uh, at the church. President Hudson, I know you've indicated that you were aware and certainly um, of the nonprofit security grant uh, program. Certainly we know that bomb threats against HBCUs is nothing new. Uh, we're certainly here today to talk about the recent series of threats, but could you just share a little bit, when did you become aware or how did you become aware of the nonprofit security grant program? Well, uh, we became aware of the program quite some time ago and we became aware uh, as we do a lot of the different programs, it was through the efforts of our congressman, uh, my congressman, Congressman Thompson, and his office uh, that really does a great job of keeping us abreast of opportunities uh, that are available to our colleges, our universities, even outside of the very issue we're talking about today. Also, our engagement with uh, DHS Office of Academic Engagement, 
And that's a more recent uh, effort. Uh, we signed an MOU with them this past fall has helped increase the awareness of these various programs uh, that you may not otherwise be aware of. You know, sometimes we put opportunities out in a way where we assume that everyone knows. And so when funding agencies, when our congressmen, uh, when they're intentional about letting you know, uh, and sometimes it's as simple as sending an email, hey, just wanna make you aware of this opportunity. When those efforts happen, it really helps our ability to not only know the importance of the issues that these grants may address, but also it gives you some uh, comfort, if you will, that your applications will be reviewed seriously and this is an opportunity that they want you to have. And that's so important. Grant writing oftentimes is competitive amongst universities. So as I said before, when you up the pool of resources and make it more available to more schools, that helps, and when you provide that outreach for the opportunities that are available, you're gonna get more people writing and you're gonna open that opportunity up to more institutions. You know, I, I think about how critical information sharing is and the unbelievable number of, of houses of worship, and thank God for those and the HBCUs too, but disseminating information to all might be quite challenging. Are your institutions part of organizations that could help disseminate information and coordinate technical as assistance uh, if needed? We're just trying to find the better ways to get information out to larger numbers of, of institutions. Absolutely. For either one. Yeah, well, absolutely for uh, certainly colleges and universities, HBCUs. For us, we're members of the Thurgood Marshall College Fund and they are a great organization in terms of disseminating information to member institutions and following up with those facilitating webinars, uh, facilitating Zoom chats in which we can get a, uh, additional information and actually speak with the funding agencies and those officials who are responsible for administering those grants. So I would always say that those organizations, you also have uh, UNCF as well, are really key and vital. And to the extent that those funding agencies work with those organizations, that information does filter out better to the individual institutions. I'm out of time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair recognizes the general lady from California, Ms. Gap Barragon, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing today. It calls attention that to the disturbing trend of increased bomb threats at black colleges and historically black colleges and universities. Let's be clear, these acts of intimidation are rooted in racism and bigotry, and they should outrage all of us. In my district, Charles R. Drew University, a historically black graduate institute, received two bomb threats in January. In their 55 year history, nothing like this has happened before. These threats cause terror for their students and staff alike. Mr. Chairman, thank you for immediately raising the seriousness of these threats with the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security. I'm here to work alongside you and this committee to address domestic violent extremism, acts that promote dangerous, violent, white supremacist ideologies. ideologies. Uh, President Hudson, you spoke about this a little bit um, uh, in, the, in your last answer. In my district, Charles Ardrey University is still unsure if the bomb threat perpetrator was caught and if they were targeted by the same individual or groups as other HBCUs across the nation. In your testimony, you emphasize the importance of close collaboration with the Department of Homeland Security. Do you know if the department is working alongside HBCUs to coordinate information about these bomb threats? And do you have any recommendations for information sharing? Uh, yes, they have been um, very uh, helpful in terms of disseminating information and coordinating uh, with the member institutions. I can personally attest that I've heard from several individuals through the Department of Homeland Security, uh, including my congressman, uh, through local law enforcement, state law enforcement, federal law enforcement, uh, just that personal recognition that we know this is out there, we're doing everything we can to assist, uh, that has been very helpful. Uh, again, I would, I would uh, recommend continuing to work not only directly with those institutions, which that personal touch is so important, uh, you know, once you've received the threat, but also working through those member organizations, uh, those umbrella organizations, as I mentioned, Thurgood Marshall, and there are several others, 
they are very good at getting us all together and making sure we're all receiving the same information and making sure we're all receiving the same opportunities uh, to learn more about resources, uh, to speak with those administrators, those high-ranking administrators that have the ability to move the needle as it relates to these issues. So I would just Thank ask you. that they continue that effort uh, along, along those lines. Thank you. Reverend Manning, as our society has become more digital and users can post anonymously online with greater ease, how has Mother Emanuel addressed 21st century online threats? And are you aware of the actions that other faith-based institutions are taking to make sure their congregation members feel safe during this time of increased threats? Yeah, thank you for the question. Let me answer the first question or the last question first. Um, so our work, of course, with the uh, Jewish community, uh, Tree of Life has actually borne a lot of fruit uh, in that regard where we do talk on a regular basis, Rabbi Jeff Myers, and I have a personal connection. Uh, so we do do that in that regard, as well as uh, part of uh, some of the other platforms that we do, uh, we are able to plug into, we're able to hear about some of the threats uh, locally here within uh, the city of Charleston. Uh, as far as online, uh, when we have those type of at, um, attacks that may come on our Facebook page, uh, the only thing we can do is, of course, uh, go in and remove them and then report them to uh, Facebook in that regard. Uh, but the online presence is, is indeed something that we have to spend some time in uh, because there is so much uh, immense anonymity that is out there. Uh, where people can just post and then whatever they're going to say, they can say, and then we just have to make sure uh, that we are doing our level best to remove all of those type of comments that come up. Thank you for that. Ms. Nielsen, in the wake of the recent HBCU bomb threats, the NAACP called for the full accountability, arrest, prosecution, and conviction for those responsible for these threats. Charles Ardrey University in my district still doesn't know if the perpetrator was caught. Can you talk about the importance of accountability and how Congress can help address the unequal and selective criminal justice enforcement measures you've seen over the years? Yes, thank you. I, I want to emphasize how important it is for uh, Congress and for federal law enforcement to aggressively investigate and prosecute hate crimes. They are a scourge on our society. They represent our, our very worst inclinations, and they have the ability to spread, to uh, invite copycat instances of violence, and often involve mass efforts at, at uh, extracting violence against particular communities. So it is something that we are deeply concerned about. We've talked about some of the historical instances and events that are known to many of us, but there are many also that fall under the radar and your reference to the threats of the schools in your districts are a great example of ones that we don't hear about every day in the news, but still wreak the havoc that we've been discussing in terms of the terror that they produce in individuals and in whole communities. Thank you. Thank you all for all our witnesses. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes a gentleman from New Jersey. Mr. Malinowski for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today. Thank you to our witnesses. Uh, I'm sure we all wish we weren't uh, having to talk about this, but it's important that we, we are. Um, we're, we're seeing a, a staggering increase in, in the number of domestic bombings in the United States. In 2020, the number skyrocketed by 71%. In the first few months of this year, alone we've seen an unprecedented wave of 57 improvised explosive device threats or IED threats against institutions like our historically black colleges and universities and places of worship more generally. We can talk about the root causes uh, and, uh, and we've done that uh, in this committee uh, and, and elsewhere, the, the rise of domestic extremism and generally the role that social media uh, companies uh, play in amplifying and recommending violent extremist content, but we're, we're here today to uh, ensure that as we deal with those root causes, we're, we're also acting to protect 
um, the, the potential targets of, of these attacks. Um, we have to do more to help our state and local uh, communities and governments and others that serve on the front lines with the resources that they need to identify and protect institutions most likely to be targeted. That's why uh, I recently introduced and the committee unanimously supported the Bipartisan Bombing Prevention Act, a bill that formally authorizes the Office of Bombing Prevention uh, or OBP to provide counter IED training and guidance to targeted organizations and, and working with federal partners like FEMA to administer grants to those institutions that would be most likely to be attacked. Um, I know since January, OBP has been in contact with over 100 uh, historically black colleges and universities, as well as FBI and local law enforcement offering their expertise and support. Um, so I wanted to ask um, Reverend Manning and Mr. Hudson, um, a, a part of OBP's mission is coordinating a co comprehensive national counter IED strategy. And I wonder if you could speak to the importance of having that kind of holistic and strategic approach to bomb prevention. Well, I, I would think that it, it would definitely be advantageous um, from a connection with Amy Church perspective. It would help uh, in making sure that all the churches uh, across the United States and, and there I say the world are uh, have the most recent information, and I think that would help immensely. I, rev I echo uh, Reverend Manning's sentiments uh, from the colleges and universities side, definitely having access, full access uh, to all that information uh, at the same time will be very beneficial. It also aligns with the multi-tiered approach uh, that is necessary uh, to combat this issue. Uh, you have to look at it from all levels and having that type of coordination and that dissemination of information amongst colleges and universities so we can review best practices, for instance, uh, would be most beneficial. Thank you. And, and say a little bit about the support and outreach that you have received from the federal government um, along those lines and whether you think there's room to grow and strengthen that collaboration. Well, we are excited about the um, collaboration uh, and the assistance we have received from the federal government. Uh, just from, uh, again, the opportunities uh, that are being provided for funding and the ability to increase uh, the pool of those funds, the availability of those funds, and again, the interaction with the funding agencies. So those things are very important, and we would just like uh, for that to not only continue to be enhanced, but to be enhanced, and, and again, allow for more universities to really improve and increase their capacity. I will say, uh, you know, for Jackson State, and this is true for most HBCUs, uh, without that federal support, uh, it, it will be difficult for us to meet the moment, if you will, and for us to build our capacity to properly respond uh, to these ever-increasing threats. This is not the last time this will happen. Uh, these things will continue to happen. History often repeats itself. Uh, the assistance of the federal government is going to be necessary uh, to allow us to meet those threats and really build our capacity in doing so. Well, I'm afraid you're right, and, and we will do whatever we can to, to help. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, young lady from Texas. If you would just allow me a moment to put something on the record, I'd know if you were closing at this time, Mr. Chairman. Thank mm -hmm. you so very much. Um, Thank you all so very much. Uh, this has been powerful and um, instructive to all of us who represent HBCUs. I do want to uh, just reassert the nonprofit security grant program for the nonprofits, but also the recent vice president's announcement that may have been already mentioned by the, by the chairman, but I just wanted to say it again uh, for our HBCU schools is the project school emergency response and uh, to violence project serve that you can now immediately get in the queue application for $50,000, dollars I am very um, uh, uncertain that this will not happen again. Uh, and I encourage, uh, first of all, the chairman should be thanked because we were the first committee, I think, to have a classified briefing. But I encourage uh, the FBI, DHS, and others uh, because of the overhanging threat uh, to move as expeditiously and thoroughly as possible. Uh, uh, in uh, 
uh, in uh, their ability to give you answers in many instances. So, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to uh, indicate that we are collaborating with the administration, we're collaborating with uh, members of Congress in our districts. We hope that you all will call upon us uh, so that we can ensure the safety of all of you and to use these grants that have now been evidenced. Thank you so very much. With that, I yield back. General Lady yields back. Uh, let me thank the witnesses for their testimony and the members for their questions. Uh, Reverend Manning, uh, your maiden voyage as uh, a witness to Congress uh, will be duly noted. And uh, let me say you pass with flying colors, <laughs> by the way. We thank you for it. Uh, however, we will have uh, staff reach out uh, to you directly uh, on making sure that you and anyone you suggest uh, would have any and all information relative to uh, the nonprofit programs that uh, Mother Emanuel can benefit from. Uh, you should not have had to spend $50,000 of your own money uh, when we have monies available uh, right here uh, to help. Uh, let me say to Ms. Nelson, uh, your organization has a tremendous job to do. You need to help uh, keep the conscience of this country uh, on track, uh, and make sure we do the right thing. Uh, we are a nation of laws. Uh, sometimes those laws have been bent uh, to the uh, negative impact of others. So I, I applaud you for that. Uh, President Hudson, um, your institution is a, uh, a great institution, not because I have a degree from there, but I also represent it. So uh, I appreciate you coming, and uh, I know you have a tremendous uh, uh, challenge ahead of you. Uh, the one thing that uh, I want to talk about on our historically black colleges, when threats occur, uh, then all of us who've had children to go to college, the first thing that comes to our mind is it's safe. And so part of what we have to do is mitigate uh, the issue to, to the extent practicable so that parents don't have to wonder when I send my child to college, uh, is it a death sentence or is it there so that they can get uh, the expectation of a wholesome education. And, and our committee is committed to doing that. That's why the ranking member and others uh, have joined me in trying to increase this pool of money uh, for institutions and other nonprofits to take advantage of it. Uh, it's not uh, enough, uh, it's a start. But coupled with that is some training and coordination uh, that can be equally as helpful as, as investment in dollars. So we look forward to that uh, going forward. The members of the committee uh, may have additional questions for the witnesses, and we ask you respond expeditiously in writing. Uh, the chair reminds members that the committee's record will remain open for 10 business days. Without objection, uh, the committee stands adjourned.